Okay, folks, and welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast. I am your host, John Morris, and this week I am with internationally renowned artist, finger painter and animal lover, Iris Scott, as we talk one artist to another. Today we'll be talking about her journey as an artist, how she got from where she was to where she is now, her mindset when creating these beautiful paintings, her views on drugs, substances and hallucinogenics, and her goals and ambitions for the future. All that and so much more on this episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and welcome to the show that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. We do this through inspirational, motivational, educational content, and I am so delighted and pumped up today. She's joining us. There's a little bit of signal issues, but it's still amazing to have her here. My guest today is a pioneer. She is someone who has made finger painting just, just not only an amazing business for herself, but she also made it really, really cool. An amazing mind and probably one of the most creative people that I've ever had the privilege of talking to. Please welcome today my guest, the wonderful and always energetic Iris Scott. Iris, welcome to the show, my dear. How are you doing? Hello, and thank you for having me. It's a morning here in New Mexico. It's a beautiful, snowy, sunny day. Sounds good. Winter is definitely here in, in Scotland, but we're just hitting that autumnal change now. So uh, that everything's sort of turning reds and greens and, and everything. And it's nice, but winter's definitely coming. That's for sure. Brilliant. Okay, doke. So Iris, for the, the one person on a desert island, way, way, way out in, the, in uh, wherever it is, that hasn't heard of you, hasn't seen your artwork, has no access to social media or papers, TV or anything. Tell the folks at home a little bit about yourself and and who you are. So I am a 36 year old professional finger painter living in New Mexico. Um, That's not Mexico, that's still the United States. Some people get that confused. Uh, It's borders Colorado. I um, grew up in Seattle and loved art from a young age. Um, the past six years I was living in New York City and that was a a wonderful experience but it was time for me to to get away and and set some roots and um, probably start a family so um, I'm I'm here way out in the country now Um, I'm down a a long very long nine mile dirt road um, in really the middle of nowhere which is good because I can focus on um, art and only art all day long so um, I dropped the brushes and just took up finger painting in 2009, and the rest is sort of history. That is fantastic. Iris, you know, again, again we're going to unpack so much, I'm sure, today. What was it like for a young Iris Scott? What was early life like for you? Well, um, I was very blessed to um, find myself... Um, born into a very safe family, right? So I didn't grow up with uh, any uh, major traumas or difficulties. Um, and, and I realize now how lucky that is. Um, we lived down a, uh, a quarter mile long dirt road and uh, my parents both worked at home as a piano teacher and a cabinet maker. And it was a very loving, creative household. So I was um, seeing um, how to work with your hands and how to practice and build your own little business. And I took that into my adulthood. 
um, they were kind of hippies and uh, we had a lot of farm animals and pets and, and even exotic pets like parrots and lizards. And um, yeah, my parents were very playful and um, they, um, they, the message that they instilled upon my sister and I was do what you love. Money's not that important and just do what you love well. That's really awesome. And it's, it's really cool. Actually, you mentioned about um, was it your mom that was a piano teacher, because my wife is also a piano teacher as well. So that is um, very, very close to home for me. So that's really, really awesome. I want to ask oh, you, it, it, yeah. it is, I mean, it's an incredible thing to, for both of us being, you know, one an artist and the, the other a piano teacher. And, and we just, we also work together as well in this business as well. So it's really, really cool. What was school like life or school life like for you? Um, I went to a uh, public school and uh, was very lucky to have um, my first, second, and third grade teacher had been a muralist and artist before she had gone into teaching. So she was introducing us to art making um, at a very young age and in a fairly serious way. And that made a big impact on me. I told her every day that I was going to become her. And she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> And then I did. <laughs> I totally copied her all the way through high school. I, and then I got my teaching degree. And, and then um, I, I thought I would be a teacher, a fourth grade teacher, because I didn't know you could actually make a living on art. I hadn't really seen that as a thing, truly. Um, and and then so later in, by in 2009, when my art career took off, I was kind of sad to realize that I, I wasn't going to become a fourth grade teacher because there's another, like you said, another incarnation of me that would have loved that job also. It, it's definitely a, a very, very different role um, and, and one that I can understand because, you know, I, I've done the art teacher side where we built our own art school uh, when Facebook changed their algorithm. Sorry, the, the sun is actually beaming straight through the window right now. So it's proof that sun does shine in Scotland. Um, but I did the, you know, the, 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 um, the art school thing. We built our art school um, in 2017 when Facebook changed their algorithm. It's very different. I, I learned that from, you know, then just focusing on your own paintings and doing your own thing. Um, and it's, it's worlds apart. But like you say, it's different incarnations. Everything's for a season, periods, and you gain so much experience from that as well. I wanted to ask you as well. Um, about your time in Taiwan. So you, you finish up school. I'm assuming at that point, it's you know, a case for you of, okay, I either look at further education or time traveling perhaps. What, was, what, what really led to your time in Taiwan? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, I, had, I had graduated from college, um, graduated um, from um, my master's in teaching. I had paid off my student loans through nannying in Seattle, Washington, and I had this very special moment um, where I was free, and I mean really free. Yeah. I had no debt, I had education, and I had been bitten by this travel bug because I had done study abroad okay. my junior year to Italy. Wow. And I knew that, ooh, I'm I'm addicted to big changes. So <clears throat> I started researching kind of where my dollar could go the furthest mm -hmm. and where was a really great place for a single woman to just uh, drop in for a year. And Taiwan seemed like a really, um, like a, a little secret mm -hmm. of, the in, of the international travel. It really hadn't been discovered yet. And so the, and maybe it still hasn't, um, the, the cost of living was so low that I knew I could kind of live like a little queen there. And so not really knowing what I was doing, I didn't even really think I was going to paint there. I thought I'd just teach English to sort of make a basic living and then come home a year later and become a grown up and enter <laughs> the workforce as a teacher. So I bought a round trip ticket for a year later and packed a bag that was too big, like a fool. <laughs> I learned that lesson quick and I left. And um, 
it was the best damn decision I've ever made, that ticket. Because when I landed in Taiwan, I had to use all of my brain. You know, like you're really, you're really turned on yeah. when you are in a new, frightening, bizarre place. Mm -hmm. The days get really long because every moment is new. Kind of like when you were a child. You yeah. remember how long a day mm -hmm. felt when you were a child? Well, when you're traveling in a place that's very foreign, um, it's, it's difficult, it's new, it's exciting, and time slows down. Yeah. And I really liked that. Um, so I, I found an apartment. Um, I, I even found an oceanfront apartment wow. for $100 a month. That's amazing. And I made friends instantly because people are like, what are you doing here? Be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone wanted to take care of me. Oh. And um, I was just treated like I was treated with so much love and respect. And I mean, like I would be walking down the street and like a young woman would just zoom up next to me on her scooter and say, hi, what's your name? Let's <laughs> let's go out to lunch. <laughs> and I would be like, OK. I mean, I loved the attention, um, and and pretty soon I was really pretty dialed in, and I was making money as teaching English, and, I, and then I realized, wow, I'm making more money than I even need. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should paint, and so I bought art supplies because art supplies are everywhere in yeah. Taiwan. So our instrument store, tutors, and it's a it's a land of teachers and and learning. And I started painting, and then I started posting it to social media. And this was in 2009 when Facebook was really starting to get legs. Yeah. And um, people were asking me, is that for sale? Mm -hmm. And I was like, heck yeah, that's for sale. <laughs> and when they were like, well, how much is it? I was like, $50. <laughs> you know, I thought that was a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my rent was $100. Mm -hmm. My rent was a hundred dollars and I was selling a painting for 50. Like I was crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was crushing it right away. I was rich. I honestly, <laughs> I was wealthy. And so I just continued doing this. I, I was, I started dropping my teaching English classes and um, my students and I started painting instead. It's really awesome and an amazing journey. And I think, again, you know, you and I have so much in common because Italy is, you know, again, if I was going to move anywhere, it would be Italy to Lake Garda. We were there a couple of years ago and it's just a stunning and beautiful place. The food is incredible, but you do need a second mortgage if you are going to eat out and enjoy the food a lot. Right. It's quite expensive to, to eat out there a lot. Right. But it's, like I say, it's an amazing place. Um, right. I think when you, you travel and you get to experience new cultures, you just absorb so much. And it's just like another, you know, another piece of the picture, no pun intended, another piece of the puzzle that you kind of see and all this new information opens up. Um, and I remember when I first moved to Eng from England to Scotland and I set up home here, how overwhelming it was in a lot of ways, because Scottish culture is very, very different from, you know, pretty much anywhere else in the world. And it was a lot to adjust, a lot to adapt to. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I spent most of my time probably being more scared than anything and overwhelmed just because of everything that was there and expected. Um, so that point, obviously, you, you kind of answered my next question, which was, you know, the point that you discovered, hey, I can actually, you know, make a lot of money with my paintings and with my artwork. Um, and that had to be really, really exciting for you as you're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of nice and I can sit here. But, and, and that's the whole thing. I think a lot of people forget that at that point like you said that the rent was really really cheap it's a hundred dollars a month and you know I think if I'm honest you know nowadays we have so much money that people turn around and say oh well I'm not earning enough I'm not earning enough but when you actually examine what you need to survive you're actually earning well over that more often than not um, and that's an incredible place to be what was it like for you having that moment in your life where you're like I really like painting I want to make a living out of this it was, um, it was incredibly, uh, how do I say, this was a huge turning point mm -hmm. in my life and I kind of stumbled upon it. Okay. I wasn't told at any point, you know, hey, 
kid. You ought to move to Asia and uh, <laughs> paint and, and sell it online and and your rent will be really cheap. And, and then, and believe it or not, kid, you'll sell your paintings for $40,000 yeah, in 10 amazing. years. Like, I did not see that coming. Mm -hmm. I was just living in the moment of, wow, I'm rich now. Yeah. I just sold a painting for $50. Mm -hmm. My rent's 100 My meals are a dollar. I'm going to just do this forever. I didn't even see the future uh, exactly of where the paintings would rise in price yeah. and how the clientele would change. Mm -hmm. I was just there and I was so um, contented with that uh, socioeconomic bracket. I was ready to be there mm -hmm. forever. I'm and so I had everything I wanted and more in that moment. So from that point forward, everything else has just been a surprising icing on the mm -hmm. cake. And so what I want to explain to artists is that there are countries all over the world right now where you can live so inexpensively mm -hmm. and, and so rich and, and have so much fun and be also away from um, all of these expectations that your native culture um, forces upon you. And you have the freedom to just reinvent and change and also most importantly to practice i was painting eight hours a day every day and um, i was churning out 50 dollars paintings every day mm -hmm. and it really was starting to add up and i say this to um, artists all the time young artists new artists it's much better to have 10 collectors mm -hmm. buying your art for a buying your pieces for $100 a piece than to have one collector who buys one of your paintings for 1000 yep. but nine other paintings just sit there. Mm -hmm. That's, that is the number one key I have learned over mm -hmm. the past decade is that it is much better to sell all your paintings for an inexpensive price than to have a few collectors and a whole bunch of inventory. Yeah. Because in the long run, yeah. your, your clients grow and what sells art is the fact that all of the pieces are sold. That's yeah. what makes art sell. And that's what makes it such a sustainable mm -hmm. career is that nothing's left. Everything's been gobbled up yeah. because the prices are right. The prices are low. They should be a little too low, just a little bit, just enough so that they're all gone. I completely agree. I mean, I've been in the, the art business myself now 18 years. It is uh, provided for me when I uh, was struck with colitis and, and other things and whatnot. And I, need, I needed a way to be able to work from home and to, to make a living. Um, I share you know, exactly what you said about the journey. You know, I, I think a lot of artists now are saying, oh, well, I'm a struggling artist. I'm a struggling artist. You ask them exactly what you just said, you know, with, with their price. Oh, I'm selling it and I want to sell it for $5,000. And we're like, okay, have you ever sold artwork before? Do you have a recognizable name? All these kind of things. And what is it you're actually painting? And then you discover that they're just starting out. They've got these ideas. And oftentimes they don't understand the business behind it, um, which is actually one of our new courses, how to build a successful art business where we walk you through step by step. And we'll put a link up to that as well. Um, and I think it's so important for artists to understand that if, if you want to be in the art world, you have to understand the art business and have to understand that your painting essentially is a product and you are there to try and sell your product. Um, and, and that's, I suppose, the best piece of advice I can give you from, you know, from my um, you know, perspective and things. Iris, I want to ask you as well, your outlook on life is very, very unique. And, and the reason I say that is because a lot of artists, you know, seem to be that they have to be starving, they have to be miserable, they have to be, you know, unwashed, unkept, you know, just, just the, the miseries of society, a lot of them. And I've met a few that are really happy and bubbly and everything. But with you in particular, it was a video that you did that's on YouTube. Um, and I love your outlook where you were just like, you know, I, I haven't been through the traumatic stuff. I've had a good life. I've had a very, very blessed life and I see life in a really beautiful way. I wanted to ask you kind of following that theme, 
if there have been any challenges that, or that you would consider challenges in your life, whether it not be in your personal life or in your own artistic journey? Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concept of how to get from where you are to where you want to be? Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit, or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up. Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you, that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only gonna get an experienced life coach, you're also gonna get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences, from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children, to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you, that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation, and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. Let's see. Um, nothing, <laughs> nothing really comes to mind. Um, I, I... I'm only 36 though, so there's plenty of time for <laughs> all hell to break loose. But um, no, I I also I I cut out um, people that are downers. Yeah. People that are negative. I don't hang around with people mm -hmm. that um, uh, make little comments that cut me down. Yeah. Um. I I picked a partner that is um incredibly supportive and loving and has his own art form that he is in love with yep. that he's a writer and he's doing that very fully and um i think that's really important you know mm -hmm. i i don't um, accumulate a bunch of stuff and have to maintain it um i i don't like i say to, i say to my um mom often um we're very similar if, if something is stressful um, get rid of it, you yeah. know, like, like, just, we're not going to be living with that anymore. You know, simplify, um, less is more kind of lifestyle. And Absolutely. I think that that has helped um, me feel calm. I, I think that's a really good point there, you know, and again, that the whole simplicity of life, the more that you have in your life, the more that you have to create stress, the more you have to worry about, etc, etc, etc. Um, and you know exactly what Iris Iris was saying there. Just because you know you may have success in your life, it doesn't mean that you need to go nuts and crazy and start buying up every single house and every boat you know that there is because it's just more stress, stress, stress in your life. Uh, some people thrive on it. Some people, you know, it drives insane. Um, but I think that's you know the secret to a really good, long, happy life is 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 just try and live a simple life. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. It just means that just don't try not to worry about things too much. And, and I think exactly what you were saying there about the people, the company that you keep is really, really important because that will make the difference between the success you have or the failures that you have and also the stories that you're going to have to share as well. Aris, I've got to ask you as well, 
And I've never had the opportunity to ask this to uh, an artist such as yourself before. What's it like inside the mind of Iris Scott? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'd have to kind of analyze that for a second. Um, well, to be honest, um, it I spend I spend all day kind of daydreaming about my career. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm really fantasizing very big um, uh, manifestations. Yeah. Okay, so um, I I am not afraid to imagine myself as the next Picasso, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I've got a lot of years left. Like, let's see what's really missing in the art world. Like, how could I do this? I believe I can. Yeah. And, and um, that, that kind of self-talk and self-brainwashing um, is something that is, I've cultivated and um, I try very, very hard to notice when that little demon of fear and uh, negativity is trying to overpower me. I really, um, I, love, I love the work of Stephen Pressfield, the, mm -hmm. the author. Um, I recommend reading all of the Stephen Pressfield um, books about um, like, for example, the, the War of Art. Mm -hmm. That's a great book. And um, yeah, I, I'm in La La Land a little <laughs> bit and, and I have, and I want to get further into La La Land. And that's why I even moved further into La La Land because I, I now live um, on, on 500 acres surrounded by national uh, wilderness. So it's, it is wild now where I live. And um, that's what I'm trying to reconnect with. I'm trying to remember um, how my brain worked and what I believed when I was 12. Mm -hmm sort of when I was new and untouched by the society I grew up in, the culture and the adulthood of um, fear. I think it's a really good point that you make that, again, a lot of people just aren't aware of is how much actual conditioning, let's call it conditioning, goes on by our society uh, because I know whenever I've traveled around to different countries, you see in very, very different and subtle ways. Some, some ways it's, it's straight in your face and everything. And I think, um, again, like yourself, that's one of our aims, but ours is to move into the in, in north of Scotland where it's going to be even colder, but it's up into the wilderness, uh, into the mountains, into the forest, which I thoroughly love. Spent you know nearly two decades painting, thoroughly, thoroughly love, and, and just can't wait to be there. Um, but, you know, exactly what you said there was self-analyzing and being uh, having an awareness of who you want to be, the life that you want to create. Um, and folks, let, let me tell you, you know, what Iris is saying is true, because sometimes you do stumble into success without even having a, a mindset of it. I, as Iris and I were talking about um, the new book that I've just finished writing that's currently in the way to the, the publisher and the printers, and it's called The Battles We All Face. Um, and it talks about, you know, anxiety, it talks about, you know, coping with depression and, and, and other things that are there, such as, you know, managing your time, actually being in the present, um, the difference between your subconscious and conscious mind and so much more that's there. And it's a real perfect gift. And it's called The Battles We All Face, available at battlesweallface.com. There'll be an ad for it at the end of the show. Um, but out of that, we ended up, you know, and just started out as this small book and that ends up going into Mind, Body and Soul, which ended up being a business and now into the podcast where we're getting to speak to people like Iris Scott and so many of the really awesome people with amazing stories from around the world. And it's just incredible how these things align and really build when you find your own purpose in a lot of ways. Um, and it is really, really exciting as well. Iris, I wanted to ask you, um, Obviously, when I believe it was last year or the year before the Australian fires are going around, you created a ginormous, but very, very special painting. Talk to us a little bit about the Kookaburra Nightingale. Oh, yeah. So this, um, <laughs> first of all, the, the giantness is important. Um, when you paint at eight by six feet, 
um, it becomes more gestural. And um, I'm able to do so much more um, the larger I paint, right? Because my fingers are not fine like mm -hmm. a brush tip. So if I want to paint a lot of details in a scene, it actually has to be huge. I find um, that. But in yeah. that case, yeah, in that case, um, you know, I was, I was, um, it was before COVID and I was scrolling constantly through the Australia disaster mm -hmm. and, um, have what, you know, knowing that a billion animals had, had died was just so upsetting. And, um, yeah, I sort of zeroed in on, um, the, the beautiful, uh, sunsets created by, uh, smoke. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just needed to make something that was the paid homage to Australia, yeah. but was loving and, 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 and hopeful. And um, because it, it's not naive. I think that one of the problems with um, the art world is that um, they address um, reality is supposed to be um, kind of dark, you know, reality, you know, we live in a, a terrible world. That's true. We do. There's some huge issues, big problems, um, disasters, political um, um, chaos. And yet um, there is also so much room yeah. for um, a, a future that is utopic compared to this. And, uh, and humans are so good deep down and um, animals are so sacred and 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 this this planet has been through so much and will continue to just evolve in beautiful ways like um this is just a blip mm -hmm. in in time and so i i wanted to create something that was kind of lush and optimistic about um, australia and that's why i painted a kookaburra night and dale which has night and day sort of embedded in the same scene. What was the kind of process that you went through in designing that piece in particular? And while you answer that, I've got a painting over here that I'm just gonna grab because it was around the same time um, that we started creating some of our own stuff. And I've just got to show you this, but talk to us a little bit about the process that you went through in order to create that painting. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so what I do is uh, when I'm ready to make a new piece, uh, sometimes I will do a form of digital collage where I will start um, digitally sort of chopping up. Um, oh, yeah, that's really nice. Beautiful. That, that, that reminds me and, of the color collage. And, and up here was a little koala bear. It's yet to be finished, um, but it's a little koala bear that was there because, again, that was just so emotional um, for me. And then down here to the bottom right, we've got a little bumblebee. Um, which was really special to me. Okay. So that again, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's so cute and wonderful. It, it was the bumblebee because we had one that came into our um, back garden in Scotland where I literally just wanted to, uh, for whatever reason, it wanted to spend its last moments with me and the cat. And we, we took care of it the best we could. It, you know, And again, it was a really emotional thing. So several of my pictures at that point had this bumblebee in um, and that's, you know, that, that went from there. Sorry, Iris, please continue. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Did you say there was a koala bear in Scotland? No, no, the, def definitely not. It's too cold for the koala bears in Scotland, but it was the, the inspiration. I was going to say, what on earth? <laughs> Although, oddly enough, we are talking to a lady in an upcoming episode who owns uh, a sanctuary out in Australia, and she's got 17 kangaroos, uh, and I think for koala bears. So that's gonna be really, really exciting to talk to her. But this was, um, I suppose, in my way of, of sharing my feeling toward the, the, uh, the koalas that were out there, unfortunately, that were suffering and all the tragic videos and everything that were out there. Um, and, you know, I, I think we call this a place of sanctuary um, because it was just that place of safety and, and things that were there. So that was, that was my little tribute to, to, to I suppose, that story and everything. Sorry, Iris, please continue about your painting. Oh, so what is what I do is um, I collage digitally um, a bunch of new imagery that I've collected um, all from all over. Um, and I also will chop up old paintings and I begin just kind of laying them out and um, laying them on top of each other and waiting for something sort of magical to appear. 
And um, in that case, um, that's how that that's how that particular piece came to be. And so once the plan is made, um, it's printed small as a study, and um, and then I, I I blow it up, and and then in the process of blowing it up, there's um, new avenues of uh, embellishments to be made because it's so big. So you get mm -hmm. to sort of run and run with these zones. Absolutely. That's fantastic. And obviously we're talking about uh, the size and scale of paintings. One of your latest, uh, which are, again, we'll, we'll be putting up photos and things so people can see, um, I believe was a, an eight foot by six foot. Do I have that correct of the shaking dog? Was that the one of Salvador? I believe. Yeah. What correct. was that yep, that's like? Exactly right. <laughs> Oh, well, um, in that case, uh, I was living in an Airbnb in mm -hmm. New Mexico before I had found my place here. And um, I, <laughs> I had turned her sort of uh, tool shed, the lady I was staying with, um, I had turned her tool shed into a studio. So the painting actually took up an entire wall oh, wow. with almost no wiggle room. It was a very tight, uh, I was basically suffocating from the paint in that small studio. Oh, really? So uh, I had to leave the windows open um, during the winter. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a rough, but it was kind of fun because it was sort of absurd. And then um, her dog happened to be a shepherd and a water a water dog too. And, and that's how that painting came to be. And then bizarrely, it looked like Salvador Dali. I was going to I say that, that it, it's incredible when you get to see it, folks, you'll be able to see the, the mustache that's there as well. Salvador was one of my absolute uh, heroes in the art world. And I loved uh, in particular, whenever I was teaching, teaching about the melting clock and teaching kids in particular how to do that, all from the shapes and perspective. And they were like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Reintroducing Salvador to a, a brand new audience, which was amazing. Um, and uh, Yes, just, just incredible. And some of the other artwork that we, we actually have in the Kelvin Grove Museum, uh, probably about an hour away from me, is just stunning. I mean, it really is beyond belief. St. John of the Cross uh, is the original work actually hangs there. I've seen it numerous times and it's just stunning. And, and the sketches that go with it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Iris, I want to ask you as well, because you mentioned about Mexico. Now I know the answer to this, but obviously our audience won't. What was it for you that was really special about the location where you built your new home and why Mexico? Well, in New Mexico, which which um, is part of the Four Corners, sort of the southwest of um, the United States, it's a desert. It's a high desert. It's um, it's it has one of the, I think it has one of the lowest populations in in the United States um, and the largest um, land mass of national uh, wilderness protected land. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an artist mecca. Um, there are so many galleries here for how small it is. And um, all I can say about New Mexico is um, there is something kind of weird about this place. It's, it has a sort of, um, I want to say that it's sort of teeters on scary okay. because the landscape is in some ways um, so geologically um, interesting and there's so few trees that it's I, like for example I live on the edge of a, a rock canyon and um, the, it has caves and and, and dinosaur bones and wow. and mammoth bones and it's just like it's a very intense moonscape um, where I move mm -hmm. where I moved to and uh, for me, that was, I did that because I kind of wanted to um, not only kind of feel the earth under my feet, but to kind of feel space yeah. also, feel outer space and mm -hmm. that kind of connection to the otherworldly. That's really awesome. There was also an artist that inspired um, your decision, was there not, in terms of the mountain that she saw and um and, and the geographical location mm -hmm. which is yes george o'keefe um mm -hmm. made her made her home a few miles from here she painted um multiple times the pedernal mountain and um yes i can actually see 
her ranch from my house. It's a, it's several miles away. Wow. That is really, really cool. I'm going to ask you as well, what are some of the inspirations and some of the things that you find inspiring to you in, in 2020? Um, to be, I haven't started on it yet, but, um, I'm really interested in the feathered dinosaur now that I've moved to dinosaur country. (laughs) So, um, something you may see in my work in the coming year or two is an exploration of that. I feel that, um, I feel that not only have dinosaurs, but especially feathered dinosaurs not really been addressed Mm -hmm. by female artists at all. Um, and I think that there, I think that that subject might be wide open. Um, I, I'm very much inspired by, uh, rocks, you know, honestly, I gave up trees Mm -hmm. and now I'm just eating up rocks. So, um, rock formations, hoodoos, hoodoos are when a, a large rock, um, is standing on a, a spire of sandstone. Um, because the rock, the huge boulder has, um, has prevented the sand from underneath it from being eroded. So it creates wow. this huge chimney formation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what inspires me, you know, the animal world, um, walking, um, backpacking trails mm-hmm. deep into the mountains and, and um, just uh, vibrating with that, that nature's uh, tone. That's really awesome. And, and, you know, again, and again, like we say, you know, it's talking about going back to your roots, basically going back to, you know, nature, going back to, um, you know, just that connection, which I think a lot of people certainly that live in the city have really, really lost. Who are some of the artists or people in general that inspire you? Um, I, well, when it comes to when I, when I want to go have fun, you know, like when I want to go be city girl, yeah. um, I take myself to museums and spend the whole day just um, absorbing and, mm-hmm. and, and taking notes and photographs and, and, and you know, eating pie in the, <laughs> and coffee in, in the uh, cafes and really indulging myself yeah. in the wonderland of the museum world. Um, so I, I have been ultimately the most inspired by Gustav Klimt. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think he's the greatest painter that ever lived. Um, I think, uh, singer Sargent, um, had, had the most fantastic ability to capture, um, the real, mm-hmm. um, in an, in a painterly way. And, um, let's see, I, I also love, uh, Frida Kahlo, um, and, and those are the ones that really come to mind as like whoa like I can just stand in front of those paintings and just be blissed out yeah. of my mind it's it's really cool because I know you know anytime we've we, we've gone to uh, exhibitions and galleries and, and opening nights and things like that there are a lot of artists certainly out there that I find it hard to resonate with there are others such as yourself that I, I look at their work and something just clicks and it's like you, you instantly feel a connection, a draw, a, a divine moment, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, you know it, it's, it's amazing when that happens because that's when you really know that an artist put, has, has put their soul onto canvas and, and really created something special. And it's a delight to see. But like you say, there are so many that you know, you can just wander by and it's like, well, that's nice, but it's for somebody else. But there's others that you connect with. And it's like, oh, wow, that's that's just really, really amazing. I also want to ask you, and this may seem a bizarre question as well, because, you know, a lot of artists have said, and this is one of the questions that we got in from our poll, that when people tend to become successful, they tend to change. Do you think success has changed you? Hmm, that's a very interesting <laughs> question. It's a hard one to answer because um, I know when I found it myself. So go on. about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me think about that. Let me take pause for one second as I think about that. Well, just while you're doing that, you know, for, for me, I know when I started selling my artwork and it was sketches, again, I was selling them very cheaply, the, the same as you had um, prescribed. And I found that it, it wasn't... 
I don't know whether it was because of dyspraxia or how I appear or, or whatever it may be, but confidence and cockiness and arrogance can be a very, very fine line. And I found because I had had so much so low self-esteem for so long that I was like, oh, this is finally something I'm being accepted for. People are, you know, giving attention. People love it and all that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is this is amazing. It's, it's really exciting. And then people say, oh, well, John's changed. John's changed. Um, you know, and if anything, I, I just find with the success for me that I've been able to extend that into other areas of life, obviously with mind, body and soul, with, with various uh, things that we're working on with the book. And it's just given me a larger audience to work with, as opposed to, oh, I've made all this, you know, fickle money now, which all of a sudden can disappear very quickly. Um, you know, and, and I guess that's my interpretation. Um, hoping that was long enough for you to, <laughs> to have a think. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's good. Um, I think that what, for, first of all, money is um, money is is a tool. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, when I was living in Taiwan, making fifty dollars on a painting, when I made that money, I covered my basic costs, and then I ran off to the art store and I bought more fabulous colors and now um when the paintings sell for tens of thousands um i have bigger expenses now of to course. cover yeah. like uh more and tools mm -hmm. and marketing and um an assistant and um but the truth is i still uh don't really stretch that much and start buying crap that yeah. I don't need. I still pour it right back into the materials. And sometimes those materials have, have morphed, you know, maybe mm -hmm. I have enough paint, but mm, I need a saw, you yeah. know, like mm, I need a kiln or mm, I need to learn scuba diving because I need to make more underwater paintings. Yeah. So if you think of money as just a tool that uh, in, enhances your career, mm -hmm. money is essential. Money is the good guy. Money is the goal. Money is money is going to make this happen. Yeah. And if this happens, if I can make better work because I'm being paid more, mm -hmm. then that better work goes out into the universe. Yeah and meets meets your eyes and that person's eyes and ra hopefully raises their vibration a little makes them be like wow humanity yeah. can do this i'm a human i can do anything look what humans can do and i think that that's what i focus on mm -hmm. when it comes to money and 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 not buying stuff you don't need I think that's a really, really good way of, of, of um, adequately describing a really, you know, intellectual view of money, because people oftentimes see money as I've got to have more, 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 as opposed to, again, another stepping stone to getting you where you want to go. Um, and, I, you know, there's nothing more that I want to add to that, because I thought that was absolutely fantastic to, um, to, to put across that money, as you say, is just a tool. I want to ask you as well, um, I, I suppose in some ways it's an interesting one, this one, because I, I, in some ways I already know the answer, but how would you describe the spiritual side to Iris Scott? Well, to be honest, you know, and I'm going to be honest here, um, I was not raised in a religious family. Mm -hmm. um, we were told to find our own way, you know. They, my parents literally said, go explore see what is very you yeah. you'll know when you find it mm -hmm. and for me that has been um safely dosing psychedelic um substances um and having a chaperone to do so yeah. and i and and psychedelic substances such as lsd and um mushrooms are being studied um mm -hmm. in the united states and and the it's becoming much more acceptable yeah. and um, there are such enormous successes in the medicinal qualities mm -hmm. of this. 
Um, but psychologically and spiritually speaking, um, not only like, like the doctors are finding, do psychedelics help you uh, look at fear and analyze fear, death, um, love, connection, nature. Um, I mean, they really catapult you into these universal truths mm -hmm. that are challenging but overwhelmingly beautiful. And um, so um, I stress that they're not really a toy. They can become very scary. Yeah. But um, with a chaperone and a safe place, um, I think it is um, our right as human beings. And um, we know that cultures all over the world have been have this as a centerpiece of their societies. Um, the shamanic cultures and and there's a reason for it is that um, you don't need religion mm -hmm. when you see what these substances can yeah. show you and and I I really do believe that um, the future of um, humanity will have a uh, science will actually bring it back into our culture but I do think that um, there will be a uh, a transformation um, of our culture through these natural um, substances. It, it's interesting. That I really, I, I find them profound. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, for, for so long people have been uh, conditioned that cannabis, for example, is, and I didn't obviously know that we were going to get onto this, this is not scripted or anything, um, but cannabis obviously has, you know, very much a, a relaxation uh, property. It also helps people that are suffering motor neuron diseases and, and so many other things to actually be able to relax, be able to sleep. And mm -hmm. obviously for years, you know, it was basically outlawed. It was illegal. It, you know, you couldn't touch it. You couldn't take You couldn't do anything. And mm -hmm. now what we're finding is teenagers that in some ways have rebelled and said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find a way to take this anyway. They had, you know, some of the most, and I, I know personally, because I've worked with some of them as a youth worker, um, but they had some of the most off the scale, off the chart kind of levels of anxiety when they either smoked mm -hmm. it or let it dissolve under the tongue or whatever. They became so relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's humorous, I'm not going to lie, because mm -hmm. seeing, it's just like seeing everything slow down on, on someone you've known for, for a long time. It's like, okay, this is interesting. Um, but I think, you know, and again, like you said, I think people do need to be very, very careful about it. I think people need to have an awareness and to be educated about it as opposed to, oh, I know, well, Iris Scott is saying, do this, do that. That's not what we're saying, folks. What we're saying is there is probably, and I can attest to this, more harm in some of the medicines that you can be prescribed for illnesses than there are in, you know, probably some of the natural remedies that are out there. W would you echo that, Iris? Yeah, um, cannabis too is a slightly psychedelic substance. It's much easier to work with um, than the more serious things like magic mushrooms and LSD. Um, but and that also actually makes it more easy habit forming. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, you don't want um, cannabis smoking you. If yeah. you're doing it every day, you're you're that's I think that that's really foolish. Yeah, um, you have to still be able to. You should be using them to be sober, yeah. and 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 that actually is what um, I think LSD and mushrooms are being used for mm -hmm. is treating addiction mm -hmm. of um, alcohol and uh, uh, opium, opiates um, and heroin. But uh, yes, I it it is something to be looked at mm -hmm. and something to be explored and something to be ex respected. Um, but if you're doing it often, that's a problem. Yeah. Honestly, that's I, I consider that actually quite weak. Yeah. If you're doing it all, all, all the time, and, and I, I don't respect that at all. Well, really. well, I think the person also needs to then examine why is it that I'm doing it all the time? What is it that's in me? What is yeah. the root cause of this that you know is, mm -hmm. is making me want to get high or or relaxed or, or smoke this or take this? And, and I think that's, you know, something that a person needs to examine a lot um, and, and actually look at the root cause behind these things as opposed to, well, I found a solution um, because obviously there are, there are so much. Um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and again, it's, it's the dangers of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of anything. Iris, I want to ask you, uh, just as we, before we wrap up the show with the last couple of questions, um, what advice would you give to young artists that are starting out? 
Oh, my number one advice is um, get rid of a lot of your stuff. This distracting. Mm-hmm. Uh, get rid of all the clothes you don't wear. Only, you know, pare down to what you really like. Um, simplify. Consider moving to a very inexpensive place or your mother's basement. Um, I did both. <laughs> Make a lot of work and post it online for sale. Don't post the prices. When people are interested, sell it for whatever they're willing to buy it for, you know, that's reasonable. Okay. And make more. If you have $100 to spend on art, don't go buy every color from the cheap brand. Go buy two or three colors from the nice brand. In the long run, you will make much better work yeah. when you keep expanding your uh, toolbox of high quality materials. I am a professional. And if you had me use that student grade paint, I would not be able to make a piece that is worth anything because that paint is filled with fillers and it looks awful. So don't do that. Um, Focus on what people are responding to. So for example, if, um, if they're really responding to your animals and then they're really responding to the color blue, make a very blue toned animal piece right? Combine what's working and make more of it. That would be my advice. That's really awesome. And, and I echo that advice, by the way, folks, that, you know, if you are, again, if you're just starting out, I think, you know, a lot of the time you're going to look for the, you know, for the materials that are, you know, very inexpensive. It's a danger zone place to be. And I found that in my own life, that especially when I was teaching, that sometimes you would go with the cheapest of cheapest paint because you've got a lot of students coming in, you know you're going to use them really quickly and it's something for them to learn. And But the problem is when you are learning and developing your skills, you cannot learn to the best of your ability if you're using caca, basically, or, or crap products or, or whatever you want to, to have out there. We've actually got some that we actually have on our website that are outlawed that we, ref- we refuse to have anything to do with and we refuse to actually recommend at all. But there is one that I use right now because uh, I've switched to more acrylic paint. Um, although I am dabbling again in oil paint because I, I do enjoy that a lot. Um, and you know it makes so much difference. And you can see the difference in the paint when you put it out on the palette, when it works, when you uh, start to develop and work with it as well. Iris, um, final questions that I've got for you is what are you most excited about going forward in your journey? Oh, um. Well, I am, I just moved into my studio and um, I'm now built, starting to dabble in uh, architecture and, and, and um, designing home. Wow. So that's what I'm very excited about. I really, I have an, an opus of a home to, that I am trying to design on, on this cliff's edge. And um, it's all made out of um, adobe bricks and okay. uh, will be a sort of marriage between contemporary design and the hyper traditional so i'm trying to blend something that looks both 200 years old but from one another angle looks um, very contemporary so to take in the view that's what excites me most um because uh you know when i'm not painting i i really uh, like to disappear into uh this new and exciting um version of design that's really awesome. And, and again, another expansion of your creative skill, which is just really, really amazing. It's incredible to see how you've grown and you continue to grow. Iris, is there anything that you want to talk about um, as we wrap up the show that we haven't covered? No, we really, we did, we did a great job. We covered it all. <laughs> we always like to start at the beginning and work our way out. Iris, where can folks find you and reach you should they want to find more information about you? You can follow me on Instagram at Iris Scott Art, and you can go to my website, www.irisscottfineart.com. It's really awesome, and it has been an absolute pleasure getting to pick your mind and your brain and, and just have this time with you. It's been wonderful. Folks, I definitely recommend you to check out Iris Scott page. It's so motivational, bright, and beautiful that you just, you know, every time that she posts, there's always something in there to get you energized and motivated. 
and you're going to love it. Again, go and check her uh, workout, uh, Iris Scott Fine Art, um, uh, online as well on her website and so much more. It's just it, it's fantastic and it's so unique as well. Folks, we're out of time. I want to thank Iris Scott for being my amazingly special guest on today. It's been an absolute delight picking her mind and, and getting to talk about all these different things. Um, don't forget to come and visit us at thebattlesweallface.com. There is an ad at the end of the show. Make sure you check out that. It will tell you more about my brand new book, The Battles We All Face. And until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend, because this little show is growing, it's developing, and you know it, it may just be the very thing that really helps a friend out. So don't forget to share and tell all your friends. Do all that good stuff. And if you've got any questions, do get in touch with us. I have been your host, John Morris. She has been the wonderful Iris Scott. We're out of time. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, guys. Take care. God bless. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we found out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into dungeons and dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I wanna let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself as long as you're drawing breath to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below and I'll see you on the other side.